welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. Hello there. Welcome to part three of Me, Myself and EI. This one dedicated on the topic of the self. And if you've listened to the first two parts, just a view of emotional intelligence at a high level, overarching broad church view. Hopefully you've got something out of that, what it is, why it's important, how to develop it. And we'll get into much more detail in the subsequent episodes. And this one about self really came out of the work I was doing, the research and recordings I was doing for the next 10 or so episodes. As I stood back and looked at each one of them, they all touched on traits or aspects of self, self self-confidence, self-awareness, self-efficacy, self-motivation, and so on. I noticed self popping up a lot, and what I hadn't thought about doing was focusing a full episode on the topic of self itself, and I felt to get proper foundations of that term and what it really means, it is essential or was essential to the overall series, and therefore you're hearing this episode on self. I had to go and find somebody that knew a lot more about it than I did and more than just picking research and reading it out. I wanted to talk to somebody that had uh, studied it and has experience talking about it and I was delighted to find my guest for today. Her name is Dr. Zelda de Blasi. I'm delighted to introduce her to this one and I'd also like to thank John McCarthy who's the head of psychology, applied psychology in UCC who connected me with Dr. Zelda. It was a fascinating chat. We were meant to record it in person but due to the coronavirus social distancing prevented that we recorded it over zoom in early april and not only do we focus on self we focused on tools that you can use to understand self and potentially develop a better view or a better picture of what self looks like. My goal for this one was to understand better what self was about and how to look at it from a different perspective. And hopefully that was achieved. And that really is what I want you to take away from this, understanding what it is about and maybe even using the tool or tools we talked about here for yourself to understand and maybe paint a better picture of what yourself looks like into the future. That's enough of me rambling. I will now hand you over to the conversation with me and Dr. Zelda de Blasi on the self. Do let me know what you think of this one and the episode so far. And Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to this week's episode. This one is part of the new series within 1% Better called Me, Myself and EI. My guess is kind of laughing at the name of it there, but um, the topic we're going to talk about is is part of that series title, The Self, and I am absolutely delighted to introduce my guest for this week's conversation, Dr. Zelda de Blasi. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Rob. Great to be here. Great to see you. I know we were meant to do this in person, but... Uh, I think we're, we're we're keeping social distancing rules in play here by a few kilometers at least over over Zoom, even though we're both in Cork. So yeah, great to have you along. We're lucky to have um, Zoom actually. Absolutely, it's been it's been a great tool so far. I ha- I've heard of some people getting Zoom bombed. Have you heard of that happening? No. Uh, just as an aside, some people that are probably getting used to using the tool, like you had sent me over the the link, but people might have been sharing that on on a social media the link for a, 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 a just a normal chat or if they're having a, a a meeting and people could pick that up and just random people were diving and jumping into their other people's zoom sessions because they weren't password protected meetings and and people then if, if you had set a setting where you could allow anyone take screen share uh people were randomly screen sharing out. So I think it's just oh my gosh. <laughs> being being wise about sharing it. I actually saw the um, Boris Johnson had put a picture up about a week and a half ago of the, the, the British cabinet meeting. They were doing it over Zoom. And in the top corner of it, you could see the, um, the, the Zoom meeting ID. But obviously it was password protected. Otherwise, there would have been a lot of strange, strangers joining that. So just... It's like- Party crashers in Zoom. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, gate crashing on Zoom. So just be be wary of that. Um, but no, it's it's great to have you along. And 
we are going to talk a bit about the self because it's a very important part of this series i think as i was putting together some episodes and conversations around self-awareness and self-confidence and self-efficacy and self-motivation and it it just started becoming very clear that for me it would be almost remiss in a way to not address the self first of all and and try and explain that now before we started recording I was just telling my partner I was going to talk to you and we were going to talk about self and she was kind of looking at me thinking what why why are you talking about the self like it's isn't it obvious and i was like i think there's 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 more to it so i'm probably going into too maybe too much detail here but some people might want to uh know a little bit more so with all of that dr zelda de blasi thanks for coming along let's hear about maybe you first a bit of your background and maybe how you've been able to come to the the, the place of even talking about the self okay um so so my background is in psychology. I teach um, in UCC. I teach uh, psychology for the past, I think, 14 years. Um, and I did my PhD on um, the placebo effect uh, at the University of York. So I've always been interested in um, how beliefs shape our reality and how beliefs, for example, even in something like a pill, a placebo can shape how we feel about ourselves. And in terms of what I do now is, I, I teach psychology, but I also, including social, developmental health and positive psychology, but I also um, co-direct a master's program in coaching and positive psychology. And so I suppose I'm really interested in the self because it's interesting. It's part of a lot of um, disciplines within psychology. So it's almost like the introduction to social psychology starts with the self, which is curious because, you know, the idea is social psychology is very much about how we are in terms of our, you know, our, the groups around us. But if we can understand how actually our sense of self develops and changes based on that, um, in terms of, say, the, the roles that we play or in terms of the relationships that, that we have and the comparisons that we make, um, it, it, you can get a, take a step back and then begin to understand, OK, so well, what is the self? And how does it develop and um, how does it influence how we think and how we feel and how we act? And there's, a, there's quite a bit of psychological research in that, which I think is quite interesting. Um, so hopefully I can share some of that with yeah, you. Yeah, I think so. And, and I'm definitely interested to, to learn a little bit about that. But just before we dive into it, your your background psychology, you've been in that field for a long time what was i always like asking people what was the draw into that what what brought you into it can you trace back a point in time when you thought that's what you wanted to do or what i always like to see what was the influencers maybe that made that happen um so so it's it's a it's 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 actually very long so i'm trying to think of a way of summarizing it quickly so well i grew up in sicily um and I moved to Ireland by myself when I was 14. And I ended up going to um, school here and then in, to college in the north of Italy for a year, very north of Italy. And I actually, <laughs> by chance, um, because my father was working there, ended up going to a university called Bergamo, which is, is actually has, has been the epicenter. Yeah, of this yeah Bergamo. Very, yeah. Beautiful town. Uh, and it only had two different subjects that you can do two different degrees it was either economics or languages but within languages which is what I chose you could pick different modules and one was psychology okay. and it was actually sitting in those classes when I was 17 um stroke 18 years old that I fell in love with it mm-hmm. and it was so it was almost by chance right um sitting in those classes and then learning about psychology and um yeah there, there's, there's there's a lot more from the, <laughs> from that but um I then moved to Cork and decided this is what I want to study um and did my degree then in psychology um very interesting and I noticed from doing a bit of research on, on you or uh, you've also diplomas you've probably too many diplomas to mention here I think <laughs> <laughs> lifelong learner I think is, is the right term for you but uh, even in contemporary yoga and modern dance and uh, you know a real mix uh, and do you That's see that. a connection or, or overlap in some of those with psychology and how they're all woven together um 
yeah, well, the, the dance was always a passion of mine since I was very little. And I suppose when I finished psychology, I had no real sense of what I was going to do next. So I ended up studying a diploma in modern dance for two years. Um, and now how I see a connection, I suppose it's, it's mind, body, spirit. I think psychology, at least the way we do it, is very um, heady, would be a word. Uh, and, and I think bringing in movement and um, integrating mind, body, spirit, I suppose. Uh, the, how, would, how do I see it happening now? I think within the, the course in positive and coaching psychology, we're tapping into more the, the, the key aspects of moving and the role of music and, and spirituality, I suppose, coming together as well as you know understanding research and science and and that yeah Mm, very very interesting when just triggered for me there a little bit was when i finished my coaching diploma i did it in the imi and one of our last days on 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 the core the course was a module where we went to an equestrian center in up, up the country and we were working with horses and kind of giving positive intent and how we were uh, you know, I suppose movement and and body language had a huge role to play in how you would influence someone else, and and maybe maybe is there a link to to that as well in in how you how you dance and how you move, the impact that has on yourself and and others, I suppose. I think it does. I think I think moving can change your energy, and your energy can change your thinking, and and your you know they're they're all definitely interconnected. Um, I spent two years. Um, in at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, doing my postdoc there in integrative medicine. And there you could really see it coming together. You know, we had research and educators and practitioners in mindfulness and massage and, and, and they were working with people who had chronic conditions like cancer, we'll say. Um, and, and it was really interesting to see it all coming together. Uh, and the energy, you know, just because people, I suppose, out, uh, ate really healthy food and, and also practiced different modalities. Um, it was lovely to see the whole thing com- com- coming together. Um, so I think, I think it's really important to live uh, at all the different dimensions as opposed to one. Mm. And it's great at all. For yourself, self yeah. coming up again there, but how do you find that? You know, I suppose when you're you're coaching somebody or you're helping them develop and you're coming up with a lot of these ideas and it can almost be like I've often heard people saying mindfulness is so new that it's almost something they have to do and it, it adds a, a layer onto everything else they have to do in their day and it's it's almost draining to do practice mindfulness because it's just another thing they have to do. With all of these different modalities you, you've learned, how do you integrate them all into your day without them actually becoming overwhelming in a way? Hmm. Yeah, I suppose uh, it's been a long life. I don't know what the word, word to say. It. It's, it's been a journey um, of, of be learning how the, each of these different things can really contribute to how you feel during the day and how well you sleep during the night. So how I do it is it's become little habits, little, little habits from juicing in the morning, we'll say, um, making a smoothie with the children for breakfast um, to keeping a journal, we'll say. Um, with my son he loves to move loves to move so we do maybe Zumba now that we're all at home a little bit of you know uh, Af- like the other day was Afro-Caribbean dance with a little bit of Zumba with a little bit of um, hip-hop you know so it becomes almost like a time to be with them as well as a time to move um, and I suppose I suppose it, 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 it takes it takes a little bit of time it's about figuring out actually this makes a huge difference in my life if I do these different things um and when I don't I actually miss it yeah and it's interesting to see how the children are learning from this and so like for for example my son now asks for spinach in a smoothie he asks for more greens <laughs> in uh, at dinner which is amazing you know he's only eight and it's uh and the same with with moving as well so I'm, I'm I suppose it's if if people within your family group can buy into it as well, it it just you know it's a, it's a win win. I think it's difficult if you if it becomes a struggle, as in you're you know you're doing this and yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, no, very interesting. So thanks for sharing all of that. Very good backdrop to what we're going to talk about. So the the straightforward question: What is the self? Let's talk about it. So when we think of the self, I think the easiest way to think of it is is the answer to who are you. So if you were to say, well, who am I? Um, and then the process that's involved in that, which is what psychologists like, it's 
there's a, I should mention this, there's a lot of different definitions in terms of what the self is. I think it's like 17 different types. But if you if we think of it as, as that, the answer to who am I, then within psychology, we have these self schemas. You might have come across this idea of mental representations. They're basically ways of, of um, interpreting, perceiving, organizing information about ourselves. Um, so it's a way of evaluating who you are. And it's made up of different things. You know, it's made up of self-awareness. It's made up of self-esteem. Um, it, it, but it's but the basic thing is, who am I? You know, would be the, the best way to, to exp explain it, I think. It's, so it's how you organize and how you retrieve information. Um, and it's interesting because the, the way this develops, it, it, it influences your own evaluation. So if you think about even... Uh, how you decide whether you're athletic or intelligent or um, anything, really, that's part of that sense of self. So mm. who am I? Mm. And when, when does that form? Because I would imagine as soon as a child starts talking, it can hear us talking about, and, and we so automatically use the word self. Like that's the thing I'm kind of probably grappling with a little bit is that we use it in our very most natural speaker you I even picked it up on when you said you moved to ireland when you were 14 you said you moved there by myself and you know it's like it's just woven in we just say it automatically without any thought but when does that become you know just that we almost have this implicit knowledge of what it is is that kind of make sense yeah yeah so so developmental psychologists have been studying um how the sense of self emerges and even just at the age of about 18 months if you do something called the mirror test or the rouge test where you put a little red spot in a toddler's you know forehead and face them in front of a mirror that's when they start to realize that's me you know as opposed to the so so that and there's something about the emergence of self now, it comes even earlier, um, even within three or four months of age, there's a sense, sense of separation um, from, say, a parent. That's a little sense of self. But but 18 months is when, generally speaking, a, a toddler kind of get, gets that. And then how it changes, uh, developmental psychologists have seen that it changes in terms of how you, a child in you know who's maybe five or six describes themselves. Or how, and how that's different from, to a, a 10 year old would say, because it becomes more and more complex. So it starts with things like I'm a boy or a girl, I'm short or, you know, f uh, clever. And then it becomes more and more complex. So when you start saying things like that, what comes up, the question comes up for me then is this I, the word identity. And is there a, a similarity or a difference between self and your identity? I, there's there's crossovers. So one is more about how we interpret ourselves. So it's it's the process. It's almost yeah. So the the the, the self schemas, the the interpretation of ourselves, and then identity is uh, you know the feeling of being part of something. Um, we tend to teach it together self and identity because the, the idea is that we develop our sense of self based on say. The, the group the, the group groups we belong to the the roles that we play um so for example if you feel like you're male or female or or um i mean another way metaphorically of thinking of, of this is almost like the hardware and the software of a computer i suppose okay. um I don't know if that that's helpful. Right, because I suppose when I say out, out the word identify, you know, identity, you think of the word identification or what you identify with. So you identify with with a role in in work or an image of yourself. But self is is probably a little bit more, just a little bit softer than identification. Would that be fair? I that would be correct. Yeah, because uh, you can. It's 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 more of a macro level, I suppose. Um, because in a way you might say okay yes i'm i'm female or yes i'm you know this age or yes i'm you know working here but who am i actually it's much it's it's much bigger than that um and that could be from this this idea of of um if you think of it from a self compassionate kind of point of view it's that sense of common humanity you know um a human being you know more more than any of these different categories that you might identify yourself with okay yeah no that makes sense the history of self then is that something that we've 
always, I, I suppose, known about or when I was doing a bit of research like Freud or Viktor Frankl names that came up but is there like how far does it go back when did it become something that we were very aware of yes we I suppose the first the the first professor of psychology William James would have started uh, doing research on introspection and classifying the difference between I and me and and then but since then most key psychologists have had some theories around the sense of self, um, uh, but mainly in it from a kind of theoretical point as opposed to scientific, if that makes sense, because research in terms of the, the how do we study the self and how do we change our, how we believe, what we believe about ourselves, that's kind of later on. This is the, the kind of research that we do now. So most of the research that we tend to do now um, is around the biases or the mistakes that we make about ourselves, which um, which is really interesting. And uh, uh, for example, the, you know the idea of um, I don't know if you've come across the best possible self. I've heard of it, yeah, yeah. It might be a question in coaching that you might ask some something like that. Would it be? Yes, that's right. So part of the self concept is not just about how you see yourself right now, but it's also how you um how you see yourself in the future and that could be the best possible self um it could also be the self that you you are scared of becoming as well um and it would be within within psychology a lot of the research we're doing at the moment is ever around can you do interventions can you can you develop ways of changing or helping people see what the, their best possible self might look like and what effect does that have on say their levels of well-being and um energy positivity would say our levels of optimism um and so and, and so the research suggests that if you do practice uh spend a little bit of time thinking and visualizing your best possible self and it could be a year from now five years from now um and and what does that look like so let's say you you, you think of imagine that everything has gone as well as it possibly could have and you've worked really hard and you've been really successful at accomplishing all of your life's goals and you you realize all of your life dreams. Now it, write about what you imagined, and if you spend say three or four days writing about that, that seems to make a huge difference in terms of your levels of well being compared to a group that hasn't say practiced that exercise. Mm. Um, so, it's very powerful. So it's a, a, like a visualization effort almost, and maybe just creating something in your mind's eye of what what that looks like, and and if you see it, you can you can become it sort of thing like a vision board. It's a little bit like that. And then it, the, the one piece that actually also helps is what is one step that you can take to move yourself towards that? So just one small step. Um, so you practice it, but also you do something that's very coaching um, oriented, I suppose. That um, that it seems to make a big difference. In fact, you know, if you've come across the idea of systematic reviews or meta-analysis, when you pull together you know in a systematic way the same kinds of studies in this case they've done a systematic review of almost 30 studies 30 experiments on the best possible self and finding that it actually makes a big difference to levels of well-being um and um and positive mood as well almost more than even the practice of gratitude which is really interesting wow okay yeah because that has become very popular practicing gratitude over the the last few years it, it seems to be a movement more so um and and doing it every day and you know doing your five things you're grateful for the, the start at the end of the day the the positive impact that have so you're saying the that other technique of your best possible self has a better impact on mood yeah so well we, what we know is that it's it, different individuals would resonate with different interventions so you have something called the person activity fit and if you come across this idea that it's, it's a way of measuring basically what would really what is likely to work for you and for some people gratitude would really work for them and for some people the best possible self exercise would be really powerful um so but in terms but in terms of the research it looks like and i mean you know it, it seems like this the best possible self is a particularly powerful um <clears throat> i suppose way of influencing your levels of well-being which uh which is very interesting and maybe just to expand on that actual tool is that something you would do say i wanted to, to put a, a vision of what my best possible self looks like at a point in time into the future 
um and and create that how do i then kind of keep do i just keep going back to that on a day-to-day or week-to-week basis to check in to see how i'm getting towards it is there like a a process that you follow yeah the process is just it's very simple i mean okay the the researcher has researchers have done it in different ways and sometimes in in with individuals sometimes with groups sometimes online sometimes in face-to-face and that it doesn't seem to matter which way you do it but the key piece is to spend at least at least four days so for the next four days spend a little bit of time visualizing um and actually this is a good time now in the you know during this period when we're all inside and we have time to reflect uh you know in you know say a year from now five years from now and do this maybe for the next four days and spend you know it could be 10 minutes and it'll change you know and you might add to it and you you know because i think there could be different ideas that emerge the key piece i think for me <clears throat> when i do this exercise with students is to be really relaxed i suppose get into you know maybe playing a little bit of music that really calms you down or light a candle and see if you can really connect with that feeling and maybe even an image and it can be really powerful because if you can see it um and if there's a way of capturing that image and you could, you could even have a, a a picture that you, you you put on your i don't know somewhere in your bedroom you connect to it again to remind yourself that that and it might be that the vision is something where you're feeling really energized and or balanced and then it's about okay so what's what are the steps i need to take to 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 be like that yeah no no absolutely it, it does and and i suppose the important message would be that it is something that would take time to get to rather than you know you do your four days and people can give up after a month if they're not achieving something so it's kind of a a long-term process to to, to reach it it is. And it's, it's, it's just that we don't spend enough time doing that kind of thing where you are, most of us are, are caught in this treadmill of, you know, to do less than, and, and getting to places and doing different things and never really connecting with, well, wh- who is it that I want to be? And maybe you are there or, or maybe actually there is more. And, and what does that look like? Um, and I think the, the, the idea that life is a journey and visualizing ways of kind of achieving and becoming becoming more actualized i suppose um i think and thinking little steps that can move you towards that actually is quite empowering mm-hmm. yeah no very very good a good example that somebody can maybe put into practice the the, the the word ego is something that has come up when i was looking into this as well how does that tie into self or, you know is there a connection or it, so this again there's different ways of uh, a defining ego um i mean i think i think of it we, we tend to think of it in terms of self-esteem and with somebody has a big ego right um and the interesting thing about self-esteem is that in general psychologists tended to think <clears throat> for years that it's good to have a, a good a high self-esteem and that low self-esteem is bad for you now low self-esteem generally speaking does predict more negative um outcomes you know from from maybe um <clears throat> drug abuse or or self-harm and but the interesting thing about self-esteem when it's high it's not necessarily a good thing so this is connected to the ego piece um because okay it might predict say resilience it might predict you know incentive but it, but also it can predict narcissism as well because it can be interrelated with that i think where that's where the ego comes in and then somebody with an in, we call it an inflated ego um the the problem with with that is that it can actually have a downside um to it and so the idea of self-esteem and having a, a, a healthy ego i suppose is is to have um well according to Kristen neff is is more compassion because it's very easy to to have an inflated ego become very narcissistic and and that 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 uh, unless you have high levels of empathy that's you know that's going to be very um negative i suppose people jump into mind when you talk about those uh terms and people that are, are very world worldly famous i think are, are well known at the moment um, there are, that's exactly correct yeah so it, 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 the problem with this is actually that, that those people do get into high levels of power um you know so that's that that is the the danger the dangerous piece and the other thing that researchers have found over time is that 
because in the U there's a really good TED talk actually by Christian Neff, the, the space between self-compassion and self-esteem. I don't know if you've I definitely looked at one and put a link into that. Very good because she talks a little bit about how in the US in particular there was a big emphasis on schools in boosting children's levels of self-esteem which obviously is, is not a bad thing it's, it's good to feel good about yourself because self-esteem is about you know how much you value yourself your sense of self-worth but it can go against you because of this culture of narcissism you know the, the example would be movies like mean girls or something you know like that and and bullies and 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 so understanding the side effect of actually boosting self-esteem like that uh, and creating maybe a narcissism a culture of it's called the culture of narcissism is not good this idea that you know people feel like they they deserve not just deserve something but that they're, they're entitled to her christine neff response to it is actually what we should be emphasizing more than self-esteem is self-compassion um and the idea of self-compassion is this idea of of um kindness self kindness and and common humanity um and also mindfulness because i think the problem with having too much of a, an ego or being narcissistic um is is that we you know it, as i say it's not, it's not a positive thing yeah and, and I, I guess a lot of i don't know a lot of the time that might be due to a lack of self-awareness in, in a way I, I would think right and from what i've looked into and being more right. mindful you can probably notice it a, bit, a little bit more and, and do something something about it I, from from some of the research and i think some of the stuff we shared was around the self and and cognitive biases that that kind of connect into that there was a few you mentioned maybe maybe to talk a little bit about uh, like uh, the illusion of transparency is that one that you have maybe explain what that, that's that means right, that's right <clears throat> there's uh there's some really interesting biases that we have um around ourselves one is the illusion of transparency the idea that we that our emotions are very transparent so that a lot of people are very are, can can be quite anxious about presenting or in my case talking online like this um but the idea is that we tend to overestimate the extent to which people can see and and how nervous we might be or how our emotions how, how transparent our emotion can be and so when people are nervous about giving a presentation, understanding that actually, you know, those emotions are not as transparent as you think they might be can not during um, and help the person when, when they're presenting, we'll say. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so it's that, so that's, so overestimate the extent to, people, to which people can see how you feel. And then this other um, bias, which is called the spotlight effect which is the idea that you feel like you're on a platform in or in a, in a stage and the spotlight is on you. Uh, and so therefore, if you, for example, have a bad hair day, people are going to notice it. Or in, in, in some of the research, for example, they've done studies where they ask students to wear a very uncool T-shirt. Barry Manilow apparently is very uncool. <laughs> And a long time uh, or ago. say Bob Marley, who's cool, and then ask them to wear it for the day, and then and then then say how many people would say do you think noticed you wearing that t-shirt? And most people overestimate. Yeah. You know, this they, they might say well, half the class noticed that I was wearing the uncool t-shirt, but actually it's a lot less than that. Um, so it's it's called the spotlight effect. You have you have these biases some of them are to do with the extent to which people can see how you feel or see what you know how you look way more than you think and the other biases are around these ideas of what you think is going to make you happy uh or what you think is going to make you unhappy right so so the idea is we we call it affective forecasting i don't know if you've come across the term i heard of it i think yeah so just like you could be a weather forecaster in this case, affective just means about to do with emotion. So to what extent are you good at uh, uh, predicting how things will make you feel? And what we discovered is actually we're not very good. And so people overestimate or underestimate the extent to which future events will affect them. Um, and we have something called the durability bias, because the idea is that, for example, um, if somebody asks you how will you feel if you um get a work a promotion at work you know people would say oh my god i feel amazing they're just so happy and for how long oh for a long time after or the same the same with how well, how do you feel you get we get this uh, first class honor in your degree or how do you feel if you're going if you get married and what what we're, the researchers find is that actually 
we tend to go back to the same levels, our baseline, quite quite soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I can absolutely connect in on some of those there. And even if I got an honours degree 20, it's interesting, right, where, where I got an honours degree 25 years ago, probably, or 20 years ago at this stage. When I think of that, it still gives me a, there is a, a good durability to that, whereas, like, maybe because that ties into my self-esteem, right, or, or there's a lot of self-worth tied to that, whereas the promotion feeling wouldn't be as strong right now that I might have got five years ago. And on the flip side, back to the illusion transparency, um, uh, absolutely, you would spend all day worrying about a presentation that nobody really cares that much about, only yourself. You put a lot of worth into that. Um, so it's the overestimation or underestimation. Is there any tools from the research then that, that you can use to keep that in perspective or... To, to try and help you well, with that so well of course, okay so different researchers have different uh, ideas about what you can do with that one i mean one is just understanding that we have these biases can be helpful so educationally speaking just so in experiments where you randomize people to either be reassured that should be grand you know that expression we have in cork <laughs> when you're giving a presentation and should people get nervous you know that isn't that helpful but if you can explain to people actually it's normal to be nervous, but also people won't see how nervous you are. And you will probably overestimate the extent you'll feel, you know, how you feel. That seems to actually make a difference. So just knowing that is really helpful. Um, the work by Daniel Gilbert, and he also has an amazing TED Talk, by the way, on happiness. Um, and he talks a lot about effective forecasting and how, you know, the research behind that. And if anyone is interested in, in, in seeing that, it's, it's really good. He's, he's, um, I think that's linked to this idea as well, that if you can focus on your happiness now, that's the key. Actually, that's connected to Sean Aker's research as well. You know, Sean Aker's, um, the happiness, um, advantage, advantage. Yeah. 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 So that if you, if we keep, if we keep thinking in the future, when this happened, then I'll be happy. And you keep, then the, the goalpost keep, keeps moving forward. But actually now, now is a good time to do something that's going to, improve your happiness and that's likely to actually be a better predictor so now you have the opportunity to listen to your favorite music now you have your opportunity to dance you know around the kitchen now this is your an opportunity to actually study and look at yourself and and see what, what 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 do i value what am i good at what you know what what can i do with my the gifts that i have we'll say um as opposed to keeping you know thinking well actually you know in five years from now when i have you know, whatever it is, and uh, then yeah, see if that makes sense. Yeah. So that like, I think focusing on the present. Okay, very good. When when we think about the word self, then is there a spiritual element to self? Definitely, I think. I mean, whatever way we define spirit, <laughs> uh, I I definitely think that it, you know it, it's that sense of being connected to something greater than you, um, and maybe the sense of being of of service to something greater than you and, and whatever that means as i say if it's an energy that can shape so much uh, of yourself i think it's the i mean psyche you know it's it's the spirit piece i think it's um it's almost the essence of who you are maybe that's <laughs> the way to describe it it's, it's your, essence, your pure essence um, and it's beyond just, you know, the psychology piece, which is about mental constructs and, and templates and schemas. It's it's the the vibration, maybe. <laughs> yeah. And so, so I suppose as we're kind of picking through it, then it's becoming clear to me that when I say I talk about myself, going back to what you said at the start of who, who am I, for me, spirituality could be an important part of myself. But for you it be, might be no part at all it might not make up that that picture as you kind of pa paint that it just mightn't come in there at all but something else might be very important within that so it is a very uh individual i suppose painting it's very individual and it also depends on how a person defines spirituality so for for some people it's religion but for other people spirituality is your connection with nature it's your connection with you know you're as i say something bigger than you so it, it's 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 i think it's based on how you you interpret the word sure 
when when I was reading about it, and I see this popping up sometimes as well, is self an illusion? Is it something that is is real or is it an illusion? What 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 comes up when I ask that or when when you hear that? Um. I, well, from a psychologist's point of view, it's real. It's because, I mean, if you think about a psychologist, our, our focus is all about how we think and how we feel and how we behave. And how we think about who we are is real. Um, now, we can say changes. We have um, a self-regulatory system, so and it's quite dynamic. So, the you know, the more we learn about who we are and we, the more we become self-aware, the more we work on, say, our self-esteem and and all of that will influence our sense of self as well, you know, so in our experiences and, and our, you know, our social environment, we're also social selves. So how, how we, how we are in terms of how we relate with people, if that makes sense, you know, so it's almost that, 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 that will also influence our sense of self. So if you've got healthy, uh, uh, a healthy social system around you, so people who care about you and you care about them, that's going to affect how you feel about yourself. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I guess the world we're living in at the moment when we record this, we're probably in our fourth or so week of, of kind of this restricted life that we're, we're able to live. That has an impact on our, our sense of, of self. Um, but maybe a lot of people are struggling with that because they don't have a clear understanding of their self, you know, of what parts make up their self and i suppose one of the purposes of sharing this episode is not to kind of bamboozle people with real deep conversation around self it's to try and make it a little bit more uh, layman's terms and understanding yeah maybe if i think a little bit about self a bit better of what it makes up for me that when i'm feeling a certain way it might be because part of myself isn't being looked after as as it normally is so do you think in the in these times maybe what somebody could do to get a better clarity around self and make it more kind of real or or, or normal normalize it a little bit is there anything that that they could do to kind of just un additionally to what you've already said that that could make it a bit more common for them i mean my okay so there are different tools you know you mentioned mindfulness that can be that can be very helpful for for some people um, validating the fact that we're going through a difficult time and validating the feelings that are coming, I think it's really important. Finding ways of moving feelings as, as well is really important. And one way to do that is journaling. I think, I think writing about, you know, actually what we're going through and recording that and what's coming up, I think can be very ther therapeutic, might be, might be the right word, but, but allow, allow those feelings to kind of, um, and thoughts to emerge so you can learn more about yourself. Um, it's a great opportunity. I mean, in a way, I mean, validating as well the fact that it is very difficult and people are suffering. Um, the opportunity, I suppose, is to have your own little personal retreat, <laughs> and and how and, and, and it's in in many ways it's a luxury. You know, people go very far away, spend a lot of money to have a retreat. So here you are at home with your own commodities. Use it as an opportunity to learn about yourself and what's coming up and and whether it's about the past and savoring the past or, or the present or the future. It's, it's a great space and time to develop yourself, to develop oneself and, and read as well. You know, reading, reading inspiring books, um, I think, can also I mean, there's a higher sense of self as well. So it can bring you out as, as opposed to maybe the opposite would be numbing any feelings and thoughts with alcohol or with television, but actually meeting oneself uh, can be re a great opportunity for, for transformation and development. Yeah. Carving out a little bit of time and just giving that to yourself is, is so important. I try to do that every morning before the madness begins and it's been transformative for me just on the journaling piece, maybe just so that you've, you know it is something we would recommend a lot in coaching and people think yeah it's a great idea and then might do it for a couple of days and give up on it uh, is there like an approach that works everybody's a bit different i suppose but just st sitting down and getting a notepad and writing for five minutes you know getting stuff out of your head not expecting too much what's your advice that you've seen through your experience that that works well for people is there any um there's a well yeah, they, I well, I use something called the six-minute journal. I don't know if you've come across yeah, it. Yeah, it's, I've heard of it, yeah. 
it's it i mean you can you can design your own but this one i find it helpful because it's sometimes all you have is six minutes even because the children will wake up <laughs> quite soon after you know you, you're awake we'll say um and in the six minutes it it just focuses in, you in to you know what are you grateful for what will make this day you know a really good day um what have I learned that that I could put into practice and it's just moments of reflection now you don't even have to do a journal for some people it could be just opportunities while you're gardening opportunities while you're drawing opportunities while you're cooking to connect with what am you know what am I grateful for what is what's working right now what is one thing that I could do for another person because I think random acts of kindness is, is also making that phone call sending that email you know so those kind of things um but the six I think keeping it realistic and then if you do have more time then you know great you know the artist's way you probably come across that you know even if you have half an hour to write that's fantastic and see what emerges from that yeah the morning pages i think comes from the artist's way doesn't it yeah yeah so yeah no see i think i'm doing five minutes every morning at the moment and and six minutes if you can get you know another minute whatever but it doesn't have to be a big amount of time it's just about doing it and maybe doing it two or three times during the day for a few minutes is is kind of getting into the the practice that's exactly it it's i mean i think of it as moments just moments here and there um because otherwise yeah you could it could be just you could be too optimistic about what's possible and then and then become disappointed and not go back to it so making it making it realistic it has a counterproductive effect on if you're trying too hard so no that that sounds like a really good way to kind of end it right to give give folks something that they can get practical with i definitely have a clearer sense of what self is about thanks to this conversation delighted that we were able to to do it it'll it'll fit lovely into this series on on kind of emotional intelligence and as i said once we get into deeper on self-awareness and all the other parts of self i think something to kind of go back to as a foundation will be useful brilliant and i'm delighted thank you so much for having me on this brilliant no de- delighted to have you and maybe if anyone wants to know more about you how can they connect in is there a, an email yeah. go to a website or anywhere to contact my you my email address is dad.dblasi d-i-b-l-a-s-i at ucc.ie okay um, yeah that's my Ver- email address yeah very good and do you do kind of one-to-one coaching and group coaching yourself as well outside of I, the day job I do yeah. yeah I do do coaching um, and at the moment I'm writing a book oh. on um, on pleasure wow that's that'll be interesting that's a, maybe oh. you maybe you'll come back and we'll do another podcast when the book is coming out yeah, to talk about that, that would be great yeah yeah pleasure, oh, thank pleasure you. is a good a good a good topic i'm sure lots of interest a lot of research gone into that a lot of research yeah a lot of research but all interesting you know and a ple- simple pleasures um and and how to savor and optimize and harness so that they're actually good for you as opposed to yeah, the other side of it yeah um, know, so yeah brilliant no look forward to, to hearing from you on that and have you have you a plan are you sticking to a plan of getting it completed and when is it due out or yes and I, I don't know i don't have the answer to that but i've um it's one of those things one of those projects that i started but didn't finish so i've i'm using the opportunity now to try and kind of you know complete the project uh and uh i'm really enjoying it uh it's it's I'm glad I'm kind of I'm re, you know reconnecting to it but the plan yeah it's it's not an academic book but so I'm hoping that it would be you know open to the, the general public yeah brilliant yeah cool sounds sounds great I think this this period of time that we're facing into like that is an opportunity in so many ways and well look we we leave it there thanks again so much looking forward to uh putting this out uh with the the first kind of wave of episodes in in the series so thanks so much fabulous thank you enjoy your day you too <laughs> you. hey folks thanks so much for listening to the show if you enjoyed it could you please consider helping me extend the reach of the podcast that a little bit further? You can do that in a number of ways. The number one way is to subscribe on your app of choice. This helps me with the chart ranking, leading to more folks stumbling across the podcast and checking it out. 
you could also repost it on your social media channels any of them would be great and maybe even tell a friend in person or over the phone pick up the phone give them a call and tell them about the one percent better podcast tell them about this episode or one that you've heard in the past and it will do I would really appreciate it. In the last year, we set up a 1% Better Slack community, which you can join for free and interact with me and other members of the community and improve through holding each other accountable and sharing monthly challenges. It's a lot of fun. Check it out. I'm into season four of this incredible journey, and the more of these interviews and solo shows that I research, record, and share, the better I believe that they get, and more loaded with actionable takeaways that you can learn from. I know I've learned so much from it so far, and it's always really, really fulfilling and rewarding when I hear from you on what you took from it. So do reach out, rob at robofthegreen.ie. And of everybody that listens, 90% listen and enjoy, but only around 10% actually take action, write down takeaways and put them into practice. I am convinced that if we can move that number a bit higher, the listeners will not only make steps forward towards their goals, but they will be more fulfilled and happy and better. Change doesn't happen overnight. It is hard, but it's all about taking the first step, whatever that is for you. You can absolutely do this. Make a plan, be deliberate, take action. Don't overreach. Start with those small incremental improvements and over time you will see great progress. It's all in the pursuit of betterness. So again, thank you so much for listening. Good luck and stay safe.